Well, hello and welcome to today's message. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Lifehouse. And I tell you what, um, it's a huge honor for me to be able to bring God's word to you today. And so I want to encourage you with today's message. Let's get ready to receive something and get ready to take some notes. And I'm sure God's going to speak to you. And uh, today I want to talk about seven steps to financial freedom. Yes, you heard that right. Seven steps to financial freedom freedom. And uh, this is the message and this is the content that I wish I had have heard when I was a young person. I wish I had heard this uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, if you're listening to this message, um, I believe that this is going to be powerful, that God is going to change a little bit of the way you look at finance, which will result um, in blessing for you and blessing for others. And um, did you know that you are blessed? I want to say that right from the start today. If you are able to hear my voice or see my face or watch this video, you are blessed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, um, It's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. It's saying those who have been blessed, they must be faithful with what they've been blessed with. And um, I'm here in Japan, and maybe you're watching from another country. But here in Japan, just by living in Japan, that puts me, that puts us in the top 1% of wealthiest people in the world. Um, you may say, who is the top 1%? This big word, 1%. Well, if you're living here in Japan, you are the 1%. You are the top uh, income earner, top 1% income earner in the world. And maybe your country is a little bit different, but hey, I bet you're in the top, very top percentage of the world. And I believe, and this is a revelation, a personal revelation that I had, I believe that God has put us here on earth in this top 1% of wealthiest people in the world so that we can help the other 99%, so that we can be a blessing to others. Matthew chapter 25, I won't read the whole story, I'll just pick up verse 23. But Matthew chapter 25, um, Jesus, he tells a story and basically what he's saying is he says, as you do well with what I've given you, I'm going to give you more. Um, as you are successful and as you, as you follow what I say, I'm going to bless you with more. And he, gives, he tells a story of a master giving some money to three different people. And the, the first guy, um, he went out on his journey and uh, he had five bags of gold. And it says that um, he, he earned another five more bags of gold. And the master said, well done. That's a good job. You've, you've doubled what I've given you. You've, you've proven faithful. You've been a good steward. And so the second person, he got two bags and he doubled that as well. He got two more and the master said, well done. But very interesting. Jesus said the third person, the master gave him the money, but the man was scared or he wasn't resourceful or he didn't ask for help. He, he didn't learn. And he went and buried the money, hid the money. The master came back and he gave it back. He said, I, I, here is, you gave me this and here it is back. And it says that the master was upset. He said, you didn't even put it in the bank to get some interest. You didn't even invest that. You didn't, you didn't do anything. And he said, now take that, your money. And he says, give it to the man who got five. And Matthew 25, 23, this is what he says to the, to the faithful servant. He says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things come and share in your master's happiness. Are you ready today? Well, I'm ready. We're going to jump into the word. Let's go. Step one. Here we go. Step one, um, get a plan for your money. Get a plan for your money. This is the dreaded word called, called the budget. Oh, big scary word. But all a budget is really, in John Maxwell says, he says, a budget is telling your money where to go, not wondering where it went. And uh, I'm sure we've uh, <laughs> all had those moments. Have you ever had too much month left over at the end of your money? Um, <laughs> might have to think about that one. Have you ever had a fight with your husband or wife about who spent that? Where did that money go? Um, have you ever put some money in your wallet? You've got money out of the bank. And then a few days later, you're like, where did all that money go? You see, the thing is, if you don't plan your money, if you don't budget out your money, your money will develop wings and it will um, fly away. Uh, Zig Ziglar, a uh, great motivational author says, if you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. And uh, this is so simple. I believe this is the main thing today, but we just need to plan out our money. I want to encourage you, <laughs> encourage you every month, um, get a plan for your money. Proverbs 21.5 says, 
The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And so it says, if you're going to have a plan, you're going to gain a profit. You're going to be able to save. You're going to be able to move ahead. And a budget, people don't like the word budget or a plan because they think it's tight and constricting. But here's the thing. It's your budget. You decide the budget. If it's too tight, you're too tight. If it's too, if it's too, too much freedom, too much spending, well, you've got to tighten it up. Um, you decide the budget. And so an actual budget done well is actually freeing because you set the boundaries and then you can spend within the boundaries. Um, this is great. When we started to do this, um, Yuki and I, we sat down and uh, I would encourage every person to every month, if you're married, um, to sit down with your husband or wife and have a budget meeting. This is a meeting at the end of the month or before you get paid and decide on paper how you're going to spend your money for the next month. And I believe this is good to do every month because I would rather have one big fight once a month than 10 different fights or a fight every day about money. <laughs> Am I right? Um, and usually in a relationship, one person is a saver and one person is a spender. And so you've got to work that out. But it brings freedom. And you get initially, um, she was, well, I don't want this constriction. I was tightening up the screws too much. Here you can only, here's, here's $100 and you can feed our six children, our six, not six children. That's not a prophetic word. Six people in our family. She was like, that's too tight. And so we had to work it out. But now she, it's, it's great because we can set the boundaries. Here's the money for shopping and here's the money for clothes and here's the money for haircut or here's the money for something. And it's guilt-free spending up to that box. And we set the box. So a budget, um, it is truly freeing. Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Um, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? And uh, so I want to encourage you every month, have a budget meeting with your husband or wife. If you take anything away from today, it's sit down before you get paid, write down every, every dollar. Um, how am I going to spend every dollar? Give every dollar a name. Give every dollar a place. And all of this, the very first thing, and, and we won't go through a budget today. You can join one of our financial freedom courses available at your local Lifehouse church. But the very first thing we teach in budgeting is, number one, we're going to give 10%. We're going to honor God with our tithe. And that's from Proverbs 3, verse 9. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits of all your crops, and your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over to new wine. And when you honor God first, you'll be surprised how everything else will fit in the budget, will fit in the plan. And there's many of you out here, and you want to tithe, you want to give, or you want to give more, and you, you struggle each month, or it's a burden. Burden, and I, and I want this to be freeing for you. And the only way I know that this can be freeing and that you can actually give with joy and give with generosity and give over and beyond your tithe, the only way you can do that is if you plan out your finances well. And so I really want to encourage you, just give it a try this month. Join one of our financial freedom um, courses and some our pastor or a connect group leader will help you with that if you need. So that's, that's a big step. That's a very important step. Step number two is we're going to save a beginner emergency fund. We're going to have a bit of a rainy day fund. And uh, I would suggest something in the realm of $1,000. And this is not your full savings. This is just a rainy day fund. In case something goes wrong, you don't have to go into debt. You don't have to go into credit card debt. You don't have to go into mother-in-law debt. <laughs> Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go to the bank asking for money. You don't have to sell your house. You, 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 can, you can pay something if you've got some money in store. In Proverbs 21, 20, it says, The wise store up food and olive oil, but fools gulp devs down. Do you want to be a fool? Do you want to be wise? We know we want to be wise. Let's store up in the good times for a tough time. And some of you here, you were like, I wish I had $1,000. Um, well, maybe you're watching today and I want to ask you, do you need plastic surgery? No, I'm not talking about a face, a face, uh, what's it called, a facelift or uh, fixing up something. It, you know, that's all good. Um, but I'm talking about some of you, you're, you're spending a lot on cards or on plastic cards and maybe you need plastic surgery. Maybe you need to cut that card up. You need to get into your wallet right now and get out your cards and get some plastic surgery happening. Um, you can tell all your friends, hey, I had some plastic. No, don't do that. Um, I want to encourage you, if you're using a credit card or it's, it's, a, it's a temptation for you, switch over to something called a debit card. A debit card is, is the same as a credit card, but the money comes out of your bank. Um, 
And it's what I do personally. That's what our family does. We do not live on credit. We, we live on debit. We live on our money. Um, and uh, you may say, but what about the points? And what about the rewards? I tell you what, I don't know any very wealthy person. I don't know anyone who's, who's rich or who, who's, 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 who's a very generous. I don't know anyone who said, see all this generosity and all this wealth and this company. This is all because of credit card points. I've never heard anyone say that. Um, and so let's do the habits of that wise people do and wealthy people do, which is saving, investing, not spending more than we have and living within our means. And there's a whole lot of stuff in this step. I'm not going to go into it today. Life insurance and medical insurance and different things. All this to say, you, there's going to be rainy days in life and you need to be ready for that. I remember uh, five years ago now when I, our daughter Rayma was born and um, she was born in the car on the way to the hospital. Uh, everyone probably knows that story. If not, you can see it in another message somewhere. And uh, that, I thought that was going to be expensive. But we had our rainy day fund. And so I wasn't worried. And a rainy day fund, what it does is it brings you peace. You, you're not so worried about things anymore because, hey, what's the worst thing? If I lose my phone or I had in a, in a, something happens, my daughter's born in the car, what's the worst thing? I mean, I've got some money in the bank and I can pay for that. Well, most people don't know this story that a few days later when I went to pick up my wife and my daughter from the hospital, I was waiting for them at the hospital and the car, a very expensive car, pulled out of a car park or out on the road and crashed into my car, destroying my beautiful old car and um but i wasn't i wasn't worried once again because i had the money here hey even if i have to buy a new car i have some savings for this rainy day just <laughs> just in case um now in the end god blessed that situation and and um you know the, the person who crashed into me bought me a whole new car and insurance and all of that it was a blessing in disguise i couldn't quite see the blessing at the moment at the time but that whole situation, there was just a piece about that situation because we had been living God's way financially. And if I didn't have the savings, I didn't have the emergency fund, I'd be very stressed and, 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 and very rushed and very, um, well, what's going to happen? That's not a good way to have a, have a child at a, fa at a family member. Have a rainy day fund. Step number three, and this is a huge one. It may take some time, maybe one, two years from what we see with most people is get out of debt. Um, the borrower is slave to the lender. That's not my words. That's the words from um, 22.7 in Proverbs. It says, the rich rule over the poor. The borrower is slave to the lender. And I want to encourage you, let's get out of this cycle. If you're a borrower, 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 <laughs> let's become uh, let, let's get out of that and let's become on the other side, which is a giver or a lender or someone who's generous. And debt is a weight that you don't know you have, but it's around your neck. And you don't know you have it until you get rid of it. Now, in the Bible, there's nothing that says that debt is a sin. It says it might say debt is foolish or it might say unwise spending is foolish, but there's no way, to say, there's no way that says debt is a sin. So don't worry about that. But if we want to live the freedom life, if we want to live the God life that He's given us, I believe consumer debt is not a part of that. Now, what is debt? That's anything um, that you don't own yet. So that might be credit card debt. That might be a student loan. Um, that might be a family loan, a mother-in-law loan. It might be a bank loan, a car loan. Um, th these are all consumer debts. These are all short-term debts, usually on things that are not going up in value. And university loan, that's a big one, especially in different countries. People will say, well, it's an investment um, into my future. Well, it may be like that, but you may see it as that, but there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to get a job that's going to be pay, paying off this huge loan. I want to encourage if you're a student, don't go into more debt. And if you're a parent, um, let's encourage our kids to do the right thing and not get a huge amount of debt for a degree, perhaps that they're not going to earn a large amount of money in. Um, when I moved um, from Australia to Japan, um, I went to university in Australia. They have a program. It's, it's a government form of a loan for your university. And I moved to Japan. I completely forgot about it because there was a rule uh, when you moved overseas in Australia that you didn't have to pay back the debt. And I thought, well, I moved to Japan. No plans to go back to Australia. Thank you, Australia. Anyway, I was living over here in, in Japan for a, f for a number of years, probably about five, six, seven years. Um, married to Yuki, my wife, and uh, the came came and we we're going to buy a house and we'd been saving money. And I thought, it's going to be an awesome blessing from God. And as I was going through this, um, I came across these teachings in the Bible. And in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1, it says, My son, if you have put up your security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, if you've been trapped by what you said, 
Ensnared by your words, free yourself, for you have fallen into your neighbor's hand. Go to the point of exhaustion, give your neighbor no rest, allow no sleep, no slumber. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hands of the hunter, from the bird of the fowler. And this is talking about when you owe someone something. And when I read this verse and God was speaking to me personally, he was saying, free yourself. And I was like, free myself from what? We've got money in the bank. We're good. We've got a nice house that we're looking at. The bank is good. It's all approved. And I felt this voice said, look up your university debt in Australia. And I thought, that's odd. I don't want to do that. So I moved somewhere else in the Bible and the same scripture, similar verse, <laughs> similar words came. And so I, I Googled how to log in in Australia and I Googled it. And my debt, my university loan that was about 20,000 Australian dollars after a number of years that I've had him looked at it, had grown up to about $30,000 and God spoke to me and said, I want you to take your house deposit or everything that you've been saving for your house and all the money in the business. And I want you to pay off that loan before you move further. And I felt, I thought, God, I don't like this step. I want to skip this step. And I felt God say, don't skip the step. And so I had to come to Yuki and said, Yuki, there's something I need to tell you. I didn't, sorry, I didn't tell you before we got married, but um, hey, I've got, you know, university loan. I, I completely forgot about it. And of course, Yuki forgave me after some days. Um, of course, you forgave me and we took that money and we paid off that loan. I tell you what, as soon as I hit that button, there was a weight that went off my shoulders that I didn't even know I had. And it set us back a little bit from buying a house, but God was good that year and I had a business um, at that time and, and God was good to that business and blessed it. And it, it was less than a year later that we were able to put down a deposit on our house and buy a house in Yokohama. Wow, come on, let's give God some praise. And what could have been maybe not a good thing turned into a big blessing. And I felt that maybe if we had gone into that house with debt, maybe something would have gone wrong. Maybe the heating would have blown or the water would have gone and we would have gone further into debt. Instead, we were in a good place. We were able to get some furniture, get some nice things. And the house has been a huge blessing to us. And I want to encourage you. Maybe God's speaking to you about a university loan to pay off. Maybe God's speaking to you about credit card debt. Maybe God's speaking to you about a, a, a family loan. I want to encourage you. Let's get out of this. And I'm not going to go into the details. Once again, check out our financial freedom course. But the only way to do this, the most successful way to do this is to create a debt snowball. Start paying off the small, the small loan. Start with the smallest thing, the $100 loan to your friend and pay that off. And then go with the next one and the next one and the next one. And as you do that, you'll feel good about yourself and you'll leave a, a little more weight off your shoulders. And then finally, you can get rid of the big things, all that consumer debt. Now you may ask about, what about my house? It's such a huge thing. I can't pay that off in one or two years. Well, we're going to look at that in a later step, but let's get out of debt, our consumer debt, step number three. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the message right now. I just wanted to take a really quick moment and just say thank you for all of your prayers, all of your support for this message, for the message of Jesus that's going around the world right now. And I just want to encourage you to be supportive of your local church. Um, let's be givers, let's be tithers into the local church. Um, you can do that through mylifehouse.com forward slash give. The links are below right now. If you would take a moment to save that for later after you watch the message, sow into your local church because it's going to make a huge difference. And we are taking this message of Jesus far and wide right now. And we would love our church to stay strong as we do that. So be supportive of your local church. I believe God will bless you as you sow into His kingdom and His priorities. Now let's jump back into the message and believe God's going to speak to you in a great way. Step number four, I won't leave you too long on this one, but just save a full three to six month emergency fund. Proverbs chapter six, verse six says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, but it stores provision in summer and gathers food at harvest time. And this is just an even bigger example of store up for a season, for a tough season. Now we are in the middle, depends when you're watching this, we may be over hopefully, um, but we are in the middle of a pandemic and it's a season. It's a six month, one year, 18 months, maybe even a two year season. Um, that's a long season, but God says you've got to save up for a season for a tough season. Save up in the summer for the winter. And I want to encourage you, get a three to six months emergency fund in place. And many people in this situation 
um, this pandemic situation really showed the values or really showed how people were doing with their money. Those who are worried um, or those who weren't doing well with money, living week to week or month to month, it, you're very worried about losing your job in this situation. And those who have a three to six months um, you know, train emergency fund. Yes, it's a worry if you lost your job or there's a downturn in the economy, but you have three to six months to get a new job or you have three to six months of savings and a future employer, they can smell desperation. If you go into an employer with knowing that I don't need this job, but I can take this job if it's the best job for me and God wants that, that's a different situation than when you go into an employer and you say, I really need this job because I need, I need to pay my rent. Now, that's fine if you're in those situations and we're praying for you if, you're, if you need help. But let's, let's in for the future, let's save up for a season, for a rainy season in life. Step number five, we're almost finished today, is this is where it gets fun, is you're out of debt, you've got your emergency fund, and then let's start investing for the future. And investing is planning for the future. It's being wise, and I won't read it out fully, but in Matthew chapter 25, 19, Jesus, he told the story, and the man who had received five bags of gold, he gave him the other five, and he said, you entrusted me with five, and I gave again another five. We don't know how long, how long this time frame was. Maybe it's seven years, maybe it was 14 years, maybe it was 20, 20 years, 21. We don't know how long it was, but we know that the man doubled his money. And as we get out of debt and as we have an emergency fund, we can start looking at our savings wisely and safely and say, how can I grow this money? I've worked for this money. Now, how can I make this money work for me? Yes, we can put it in the bank and get some interest. Maybe we can in, invest in a mutual fund or in, in real estate or in a business or in something. And we don't give advice here at church about what you should invest in, but we say, look at the options and find something that's a match for your age and your stage. And there's some great biblical advice out there about investing. But I do think that when Jesus comes back, or he's going to speak to us even now, um, even before we get to heaven, and he's going to say, I entrusted you with this wealth, with this talents that you could make money. How did you increase that wealth and, um, and also be able to give it to others? How did you grow that wealth? And uh, I, I think there's just so many blessings, whether that's from investing, um, building wealth, you're able to provide for your children, uh, you're able to uh, perhaps buy a house if that's something you want to do, maybe you're in a place that you can follow the things that you want to do, maybe start a business, and, um, and it, of course, be incredibly generous. So investing and growing wealth, this is not a bad thing, this is a good thing. Step number six, I want to encourage you, steward God's blessing. This is step number six. You're out of debt. You've got an emergency fund. You've started to investing. Now we don't give up. We don't take our feet off the accelerator. No, we continue to be a good steward. Um, and maybe you've got a house loan or something. This is the time when you can continue to pay that off and even maybe pay that off early. We're going to still live within our means. We're going to still tithe. We're going to still be generous. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 27 says, put your outdoor work in order. Get your fields ready. I'll after that, build your house. It's saying, it's saying, get your things in order. Continue to be a good steward and God's blessing. And uh, personally, Yuki and I, uh, this is our step right now. We've got our house. We've got our mortgage on the house. And we're being good with that, faithful with that. And we've got a vision to pay that off. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to be good. We're going to put our house in order. We're going to be generous. We're going to be tithing. Um, we, we're going to be safe. Um, and this is, the, this is an exciting zone to be in. It's been a good steward. It's, it's been able to be an example to others and, and uh, to be able to, to teach others what is, hey, here's some of the things that I went through so you, you don't have to go through them yourself. And I really want to encourage you. There's going to be a big temptation. And I've done this course with many people now. There's going to be a big temptation for you to skip the steps. You're going to be like, I don't like step six. I want to go to step, step, step seven. And step three, let's throw that out. I'm going to make my own steps, five steps, one step to financial freedom. It's called my way, um, my way or the highway. And I want to encourage you this step. Don't skip the steps. Don't say, hey, well, we, we're doing that, but we're going to take a rest, another big risk here or do something. No, let's follow the steps. And last step, best for last, step seven. This is where we want to be. This is the goal. This is the end zone. This is it. This is where we want to live most of our life if we can, is build wealth, be incredibly generous, and leave a legacy. You know, God promised Abraham that he was going to bless him to be a blessing to other people. That same promise that God gave to Abraham is our promise. God wants us to be blessed. 
He wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. Those two, they go hand in hand. They're the, they're the, they're the, they're the steering handle on a, on a bicycle. They're the, they're the, they go together. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I've always been a cheerful giver. I love giving. Um, I, I, I love coming up with new ideas and new business things. And I also, as much as I love that, I love giving um, as well. But you know what? As I've been able to pay off our debt, our consumer debt, and as I've been able to do the right things and invest safely and wisely and, and grow what God has blessed us with, it actually brings more of a joy to give. And you may be a cheerful giver, but there's levels to cheerfulness. You may be a joyful giver, but there's even more joy when you do well with what God's given you. And I can't wait that we are in step seven and we are joyful. And I've, I just still feel like there's going to be a whole lot of joy. I've got owe nothing to no one. I'm saving. I'm investing. I'm doing well. I got my emergency fund. You're just going to be the most joyful giver at that point in your life. Proverbs 13, 22, last scripture for today. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And uh, I'll finish with this today. But getting out of debt and investing for the future, you're not just changing your finances. You're changing your family finances. You're not just changing your family finances. You're changing the finances of your whole next generation. You're changing the finances. You're changing the situation of your children's children. You're actually making a difference in your family tree. And you, the future generations will look back and they'll say, what did great, great grandfather do? What happened in the family tree there? How did we build this wealth? What happened there? And they say, well, he heard a message, seven steps to financial freedom on one Sunday. And he decided he was going to change. He was decided he was going to live a life, not just about now, but living a legacy. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And uh, hey, let's get excited about being generous. This month here at Lifehouse is our Heart for Missions Month. And this is where we give to our school in Hope School in New Delhi in India. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, we are in the top 1% of wealthiest people in the world. Someday you've got to get to India. You've got to be part of the team. And you've got to see, you've got to go to India and see how the bottom 1% of the world live. Because I tell you, it will shock you. It will leave you raw. It will move your heart. It will leave you in tears. And you'll come back from that trip and you'll say, God, you have blessed me. How can I be a blessing to other people. God, I realize what you meant, what you said when you promised that I was going to be a blessing to be a, a blessing to others. You were going to bless me to be a blessing to others. I can see how much of an impact I can make. And the only way we can be generous, the only way we can make a difference in some of these children's lives is if we get a plan, if we pay off our debt, if we start moving through life, if we get that emergency fund, if we get to a place and we're tithing and we're giving, we get to a place of generosity, we can be extremely generous. We can give with a cheer heart because those kids in India, two or three years old, living on the streets, parents out at work or no parents or broken legs or sickly, um, going to be dying of sickness. The only way we can make a difference in their lives is if we have enough surplus that we can give to them. And I really want to encourage you this month, whether it's $100, whether it's $1,000, the $10 or $500, whatever it is, this month, let's give something to the kids at our Hope School in Tejas, Asia, in India. Let's start off this process of generosity. And you may say, well, I'm only on step three or I'm only on step two. Well, tithing and generosity, they work through all of these steps. They are the foundations of financial freedom. They are the foundations of us as believers in Jesus. And so come on, let's get excited excited this month about giving to India. Let's be part of something much bigger than we can. And this year, if your finances aren't in order, if you said, God, there's some things I need to work on in the area of finances, let's work on those this year. Let's be tithing in our local church. And next year when our offering comes um, or an opportunity comes to be generous, let's say, I want to give above and beyond what I ever gave in the past. And so, hey, if that's you today, if God's speaking to you today, would you join with me in praying today? So God, just thank you for every person here. And Thank you that you've blessed us, that we can be a blessing to others. And God, I pray that you would help us in our lives. Help us, 
um, live a generous life. Help us live a tithing life, a cheerful life. And God, I thank you that, that you know every person's situation, whether it's as a debt that they feel they need to pay off. Um, maybe there's something they need to write in their life. Maybe there's some area that they, they need to fix up or get out of. Maybe they just need to start planning out their finances better. I pray that you'd be speaking to us personally. We'd be making those changes. I pray that this year, this message would be a pivotal point in our lifetime of generosity. I thank you that we can leave a, a change, a legacy. I pray, I thank you that we can change our family trees. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise together today. And maybe you're watching the, the message here today and, and you're not part of our church or, or you're not yet a follower of Jesus. You don't know God. Well, I want to encourage you. God loves you. He's got an amazing plan for you. And today we heard just a small part of this plan. God's got a big plan for your life in health and blessing and relationships. But the only way we can receive all of that, the only way we can receive forgiveness from God is to invite Jesus into our life who forgave us and gave us a new start. And we can start off on this new path with Jesus. And so today, if you want to say, Jesus, I might not know everything, but I want to start on the journey with you. When I say now, why don't you lift up your hand and I'd love to pray with you here today. Or maybe you can lift it up in your heart if you can't do that physically or just let us know in the comments. But let's pray together when I say now. One, two, three, now. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life and I will follow you. Come on, let's give God some praise together today.